Okay, welcome everybody to this uh, new DASI seminar. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Stefan Mala. Stefan Mala was professor in computer science at New York University until 1994. Then he was professor and department chair at Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. Since 2017, he holds the data sciences chair at the Collège de France. He is a member of the French Academy of Sciences, of the Academy of Technologies, and a foreign member of the US National Academy of Engineering. He developed the multi-resolution wavelet theory and algorithms at the origin of the compression standard JPEG 2000. And his research interests include machine learning, signal processing, and harmonic analysis. He currently works on mathematical models of deep neural networks for data analysis and physics. I want to personally thank Professor Mala for very kindly accepting our invitation. And whenever you are ready, the floor is all yours. So thank you very much, uh, Pablo, for this warm introduction. Uh, I've been indeed speaking uh, about uh, mathematics uh, of deep networks. So this is a set of work with many collaborators I'll be uh, speaking about. Uh, one idea that is going to go through uh, the talk that you'll see is indeed the fact that the analysis of this uh, very large amount of data through scale is a very important element to understand their uh, properties. So we'll be speaking about uh, uh, the two uh, classical type of learning, namely uh, uh, unsupervised learning in very high dimension, which means uh, estimating the probability distribution P of X of a high dimensional data. But the specifics of the type of problem we'll be speaking about is that the data is structured. Structured means that it's typically indexed by a parameter U, which is a low dimensional parameter. So this is, for example, time for speech. It's going to be the sequence of letters in language two-dimensional parameter for images and 3D for, uh, let's say, surface information, or even uh, if you want, for example, to, to uh, define uh, the geometry of molecules. Now, obviously, these are very important problems, whether it's for generation of new data, inverse problems from uh, partial uh, measurements requires to understand what's the probability distribution or where the data lies in this high dimensional space. So the second classical problem that uh, is around in uh, AI and machine learning, of course, is supervised learning, in which case what you want is to estimate a value Y given the data X from supervised data, which gives you both X and Y. And typically we're going to look at image classification problems but other problems, for example, maybe, for example, regressing energies in uh, quantum physics from the geometry of the molecules. Now, the absolutely remarkable thing that has been happening now for the last uh, 10, 15 years is the amazing success of deep nets. And all of us essentially are working with these structures and uh, an issue is really to understand why they work so well. So you, I suppose, all know well how these uh, network works. I will illustrate them in the case of uh, images because that will be simpler. So you have an input image uh, X, which is here on the left, which is being transformed with a linear operator L1 that is typically going to be a convolution with small support filters. So the weights are invariant to translation, which will define a whole series of new image in the first layer. Now, typically subsampled, so you have smaller images, and then you apply the nonlinearity, which will typically be rectified. Then the next layer iterates on this process. So now you have a convolution on all the channels that are aggregated and summed to define a new image that is typically again subsampled and apply your nonlinearity. So the parameters in these networks are the set of all the filters, which typically can amount of the order of hundreds or billions of parameters for very large size a network that we optimize by uh, minimizing the error that is going to be defined by some loss function with a stochastic gradient descent. 
Now, the amazing thing, of course, is that this kind of structure answer questions over totally different type of problems, totally different type of data, whether it's time series, sounds, images, text, graphical data, and so on. So that means that all these problems have something in common, are in some sense intrinsically very similar, and the issue is to understand the underlying mathematics. Now, one of the major issue, of course, is that we are in very high dimension, and a priori in a high dimension, you have this curse of dimensionality, which is the explosion of possibility, which prevents you to estimate from a limited set of training data, an arbitrary function f of x. So the fact that these machines can approximate f of x means that they circumvent somewhere this curse of dimensionality. They use some form of regularity of the problem. And the question is to understand what is the nature of this regularity. So they, I was saying there is one aspect that is going to go through the talk is this idea of multi-scale, because as you can see, when you go from one layer to the next, when you subsample, you progressively aggregate the information so that a point in a deep layer corresponds to an aggregation over a very large size of the input uh, layer, whereas a point in a shallow layer will only depend upon the receptive field, which is much smaller. So you progressively aggregate the information over wider, wider, and wider neighbor. And of course, the issue is to understand what's the nature of the filters and why these nonlinearities play such an important role. So, the talk will move from unsupervised learning, and I'll begin with somewhat simpler problem coming from statistical physics, and progressively move towards supervised learning. And in between, we look at the problem of unsupervised learning of very structured data, such as uh, faces with generative algorithm, such as uh, a score diffusion algorithm. So this will allow us to move from simple models and relatively simple networks that we can master mathematically to much more complex networks. And again, you'll see that through this move, you will still have this idea of scale separation, but the key issue that is going to happen all over for all these problems is to understand how to define the dependencies of these data across scale. And one important tool that is going to come into the last part of the lecture will be random projections. And we'll see how they naturally comes with the harmonic analysis part related to scale. OK, so let me begin with the unsupervised problem in the framework of statistical physics. So what you want is to estimate a probability distribution, and you have partial measurements. And typically, in probability of statistical physics, this typically these measurements can be a certain number of moments, so expected value averages of some nonlinear functions of the data x, the nonlinear function being here phi k. For example, phi k could be x squared, in which case you get a covariance measurement, or higher order moments or something else. And the idea is given such a set of moments, you can estimate the original probability distribution by defining the probability distribution which has the appropriate moment, but you say that you don't know anything else. So you express that by saying that you're going to maximize the entropy of the uh, probability distribution that you use as a model. And you have this famous Riemann-Gibbs uh, theorem, which tells you that the probability distribution that maximizes the entropy, this is a convex constraint under these linear constraints, which impose that the probability distribution you search has the appropriate expected value equal to the one of the original one. Well, this is a convex problem, uh, which is going to be constrained by linear uh, conditions. It's going to have a unique solution defined by uh, Lagrange multipliers. And this unique solution takes an exponential form. So basically, the probability distribution is what is called the Gibbs energy. Uh, 
It, and the energy of the probability distribution is just a linear combination of the function phi k used as moment multiplied by these values, which are the Lagrange multipliers. So basically, if you take moments, then you have a model which maximizes the probability distribution to match the moments. Now, this is simple. What is really difficult is to understand what should be the appropriate moments that you should take to get a good approximation of the true probability distribution. So that's the classical framework in probability statistical physics. So you want to estimate your probability distribution. You don't know the energy under this form. Now, there is this very important work that was done in the 70s and which is at the root of really statistical physics by Kedanoff and Wilson, who got the Nobel Prize uh, for that, Wilson, is this idea that if you want to compute the probability distribution of a very complex field, this is uh, the cosmic web. So the aggregate of matter across the universe, the point here is much larger than a single galaxy. Uh, one way to do that, or the way to do that, is to look at this field or this image at different scale. Now, how do you do that? You take this image and you coarsen it progressively by averaging and subsampling it. You average and subsample it so that you progressively reduce the resolution. And the important observation done by Wilson is that if you look at the probability distribution, not of the original field, but the coarse field, well, it's going to evolve across scale, but it's going to evolve in a very regular way. And you can see this looks quite similar to the image you see at different scale. So what does that mean? That means that to characterize the very big field X that you have here, what you can do is to begin at very coarse scale, xj, which is a small image, so it can be characterized by few pixels. You are in low dimension. And then you try to move from one resolution to the other. So you go in the reverse direction. And how do you go in the reverse direction? You need to know the probability distribution of the high resolution image xj minus one given xj. So you do this kind of standard factorization which is like uh, if you were going along a Markov chain across the scales. Now, why do you do that? A priori, you didn't gain anything by doing this factorization. But what's happening is that the conditional probability from one scale given the previous one is going to be much simpler than the probability distribution of X. And so that's what you want to represent. You don't want to represent directly P of X. And we'll see that this idea is very key, including in these networks. OK, so how can you do such a thing? You need to compute the probability distribution of a high resolution image. Here, it's a face, given a low resolution image, which is a lower resolution face here. Now, one idea is to try to get the orthogonal complement of xj relatively to uh, xj minus one. In other words, to get the high frequencies, and these are the xj bar, which have disappeared in xj, but which would allow to reconstruct xj minus one from xj. So you decompose a high resolution image into a lower resolution image, xj, and the details or the high frequency. Now, what happened in the 90s is that people realized that you could do that with an orthogonal basis. And what is this orthogonal basis? These are called wavelet bases. They essentially extract the edges along different directions, which are here you see the wavelets done by a convolution and a subsampling. So this is a first layer decomposition. And then you take your low resolution image xj, you sub decompose it in an even lower resolution and the details that you sub decompose. So basically, this cascade of filter subsampling, filter subsampling here can be interpreted as a simple decomposition in an orthogonal base. Now, why do we do that? We do that because what we are interested in 
is the probability distribution of the high resolution image given the low resolution image. But because the high resolution can be decomposed into low and details, this is the same thing than computing the probability distribution of the details given the low resolution image. And the low resolution image itself can be sub decomposed. So it's the same than computing the details. So the wavelet coefficient at fine scale given the wavelet coefficient at coarse scale. That means that all the problem is going to be about understanding the interaction between these wavelet coefficients at different scale if you want to capture these interactions. So, we can now decompose the probability distribution of X from, as I said, the very low resolution. This is low dimensional, no problem. And then all the transition term, we compute them as transition term over wavelet coefficient. Now, the important thing of this problem is that initially, when you look at the image, you have very long range interaction. You see this curve, they are very regular. So there are dependencies from very far away points. However, once you decompose it into these conditional probabilities to understand the probability distribution in the neighborhood of the eye of the details here, if you know already what's happening at the low frequency only requires to have information on a small neighborhood. In other words, this long range dependency can be reduced to a local dependency if you look on these conditional distribution. What that means is that when you look at long range dependencies, you are fighting against the curse of dimensionality because you have many variables you have to consider. If you can localize the problem, then you get to a low dimensional problem and you can avoid the curse of dimensionality. Mm -hmm. And this will be the very important elements that I'll try to stress across the whole presentation. Okay, so let me show you how that relates to network. You begin from an image, this boat. In the Fourier domain, this image has a certain Fourier transform support, which is this red circle. What you do is you decompose it into a lower resolution image, which is here in red, and all the wavelet details. The wavelet details, they essentially correspond to high frequency in different high frequency region of the Fourier plane. Now the low frequency image, you sub decompose, as I said, lower resolution, lower frequency, and there are uh, wavelet coefficients in these frequency bands and so on. Now, if you look at these images, you see edges, and you see that the edges of the boats, of course, they look very similar at different scale. So there is a very strong dependency between these images. And the whole problem now is to characterize this strong dependency. Now, when you want to characterize dependencies between random variables, the first idea that comes to mind is to compute their correlation. So compute the correlation between this image and this one at two different orientation and to two different scale. Now you may expect that the correlation is very large because they look alike, but in fact, the correlation is essentially zero. Why is it zero? Because these images oscillate. They oscillate, there is a phase because they belong to different interval in the frequency domain. And because their Fourier support are separated, you can prove that their covariance is going to be zero. In other words, no linear correlation between these images. So that means that you need to move to a nonlinear representation. In other words, you want to capture the nonlinear dependency between these images. But you know that the reason why the correlation is zero is because of the phase oscillation. So what you should do is to kill the phase. How can you kill the phase? You can use a modulus. We have complex values or real it's absolute value. Or you can use a ROLU, rectifier. A rectifier suppress the negative coefficient, so kills these oscillations. Now, if you do so, then the correlation across scale 
are not going to be zero anymore because you've killed these oscillations. So the problem now is that you are going to get very large covariance matrices because you want to use a look a priori at the covariance at any point u and any point u shifted by a value tau, and that gives you very large covariance matrices. However, there is a way to nearly diagonalize these covariance matrices. And to do that, you need to retransform them. In other words, to reapply a wavelet transform. And now you can reduce this covariance to covariance at the same location. In other words, no shift. What does that mean? That means that now you will just look at the correlation at the same location for all these images at a given depth, and you will compute the covariance around these channels. This begins to look like a neural network where you have your filters, which are wavelet, your non-linearities, which may be a ROLU or a modulus, and you can even make a skip connections, you cascade, and then the information is really across the channels. And in this case, you will capture this covariance. So the question now is, is this enough to capture interesting physics? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. So this is a work that we've been doing for the last six, seven years with a whole team of physicists that they call Norman Superior and applied mathematicians, Sipen Zang, Antoine Brochard, Xiao Shen, Rudy Morel, Erwan Alice, and Brice Menard. Here you see images coming from a uh, simulation of real physical phenomena. Uh, this corresponds to two dimensional turbulence. This is the cosmic web. These are uh, dynamic fluid which, with an electromagnetic field. And you would like to compute the statistical physics of these phenomena. So, what we do, is we use this covariance across these networks that I described, which we call scattering covariance. It's the cascade of wavelets. And then from these value, which are expected value, we reconstruct maximum entropy dist uh, uh, distribution. And we sample this maximum entropy distribution. And these are examples. These are examples of generated images. So. Here, we you do them in some sense in a classical statistical framework, which is maximum entropy. But the moments, the expected value, we get them from this network where all the filters are essentially wavelengths. And we can do that with a very limited number of moments, about 500. In this case, we only need one image to compute the model because the model is stationary. So you can compute the expected value by making a spatial average. And you can verify that indeed uh, you recover third and fourth order moments. So you have a precise model. Okay, so that's the first step. Now, the question is, how can you go if you deal with much more structured data, such as uh, faces here, that you want to learn from a database? So to do so, there is these beautiful results of score diffusion that I suppose most of you already know from the work of Jan Song and his collaborators. And the idea is the following. You begin from the image and you progressively add noise to this image with an orange steinerland beck equation, which essentially at each iteration adds a little bit of Gaussian white. If you add enough noise at the end, the image is going to be totally buried into noise. So you can approximate it by a pure white noise. Image. Then you invert the stochastic uh, differential equation. And it's well known in math that such a stochastic differential equation has an inverse. However, to compute this inverse, you need to compute the gradient of the log probability distribution, which is called the score. So you need to run this inverse equation. Now, the huge surprise of uh, this work by Yan Song is that you can indeed approximate this score, which is a high dimensional function. So a priori, you are fighting uh, the curse of dimensionality with a neural network. 
This means that you can now synthesize a face, if you can do so, by just generating random noise and running your inverse stochastic equation, given that you know the story. Now, let me give a little bit more intuition why this result, where is this score coming from? Let's look at the noise removal problem. So noise removal problem, you have your data X to which there is noise which is added. And you would like to get the best possible estimate of the original data X given the noisy signal. To do so, you'd like to minimize the mean square error, for example. And what is known is that, of course, the optimal estimator that minimizes the mean square error is the conditional expectation of X given the observation X signal. Now, there is uh, an identity that was proved in the 60s that essentially says to move from the noisy data to the best denoised data you can get, you need to move in the direction of the score because you need to move in the direction where you are going to maximize the probability of the observation, essentially. So how do people estimate the score in DeepNet? They estimate it as a denoising problem. They try to minimize the mean square error of a data that has been noised. And the difference is going to be the score. And they plug the score in this um, inverse stochastic equation. Again, the question is, why should it work? somewhere you are able to go around the curse of dimensionality. The claim is, the reason is that the problem is not so complicated. It doesn't have a curse of dimensionality because there is local dependencies. And these local dependencies, they appear once you've been separating scales. So how do you separate scale the way I described? You take your image, you compute at lower resolution and the details. And we are going to do that exactly, oops, let me, uh, and you are going to compute therefore, not the score of the original image, but the score of the details given the low resolution. And I'm going to show that to do so, you don't need anymore to have a huge network, just a network which looks very locally at the image. So, the way the algorithm goes is you begin from the image, you decompose it into wavelets and the low frequency. And then you're going to build a model of the wavelet coefficient by adding noise. You take your low frequency, you decompose it, wavelet the low frequency, and you again build a model of the wavelet by adding noise. Then in the reverse, so the, at the end, the low frequency, you bury it again into noise. At the reverse, you are going to denoise the image. You have the wavelet. Denoise the wavelet coefficient, you reconstruct. Denoise the wavelet coefficient, you reconstruct. This looks essentially like a unit. And in fact, if you look at the architectures of large generated algorithm, they use such uh, architecture, which are in fact multi-scale. Otherwise, otherwise, they are not able to resynthesize very large uh, images. So indeed, if you do so, there are several things that is coming in. First of all, you can very much reduce the number of time step of the algorithm. The second part is you can reduce the receptive field of the network. So this is an algorithm. This is a result with few time step if you do it directly by running the diffusion algorithm on the original image with the same number of time step. These are the kind of images that you get if you run it multi-scale. So you run 10 times step, but you run them at all scale and the convergence is then much faster. Let me show an application for super resolution. So for super resolution, you have a very low resolution image and you want to build a high resolution image, which is over there. And this is a work that was done with Florent Tangut, Zara Kadik de Kodai and Ero Simonchen. So 
The way it goes is that to go from low to high resolution, what you need is to resynthesize what allows you to go progressively to higher resolution. In other words, you need to resynthesize these details, these wavelet coefficients. So what we do is first we run a diffusion model. So we learn the uh, models of a very large database, but the models is the score of the wavelet coefficients given the low frequency. And the important thing is that to learn this score, we need a neural net with a very small receptive field, typically five by five, nine by nine. We don't need to look at very long range uh, dependencies. And that's the kind of results you get. So this is the original image. This is the coarse image. And this is the image that was synthesized at fine scale. So you see that you can recover essentially the high resolution information, even of very long range dependencies. But again, the reason why you can do it and why we can master the mathematics is because we don't deal anymore with this very long range dependencies. Everything is reduced to local models. Okay, let me now finish with the problem of classification. For classification, basically the architecture is the one uh, that I uh, showed of DeepNet. And the key question that you typically ask uh, for the classification problems is to understand what is the nature of the weights that have been learned with a stochastic gradient descent? And what is the class of the function that you are learning, which allows you to get high uh, uh, classification rate or small errors? So these are the type of question we'd like to handle uh, mathematically. Okay, so the first kind of thing that we've been trying to do is to say, okay, for synthesis, it looks like cascading wavelet transform works. Let's try to do it also for classification. And that was the work of Joan Brunat of her scattering transform initially. So you first apply a wavelet transform, and then you allow yourself to do potentially a transformation along channels, which is going to be this operator over there. And then you reapply a wavelet transform that you may transform across the channel. So LJ here is a one one convolution because it just transformed one line across channel into one line across channel, no spatial dependence. And then you have a linear classification. So Initially, we've been trying to understand the properties of these one-one convolution in, with the kind of tools we were used to handle mathematically, trying to understand what are the symmetries, what are the groups, potentially do a Fourier transform on these groups. We worked a lot, but didn't work so well in the sense that if the problem is simple, like MNIST classification of digits, you can get very good results comparable to deep net. But if you work with difficult problem, CIFAR, these are images which are small, but very diverse. These are images from ImageNet, which has 1000 classes and 1 million images. If you look at the results that you obtain with these kind of techniques, networks, the error is about four times bigger than the error obtained with a residual network of let's say depth 80. So this is a big gap. And the question then is how to fill in this gap. Obviously, learning seems necessary. The prior information is not enough to understand what's happening across channel. So that was the work of uh, Florent Tangut and John Zarka. And what they did is try to learn these convolution network but not learn the spatial filters. The spatial filters are wavelets. They separate scales. The only thing that you learn are the one-one convolution, which are here. Now, what they showed is that if you do that, you can reach the precision of a ResNet, basically with uh, eight nonlinearities, 
you can get about the same, slightly better, slightly worse. But in the, the case of this data uh, set, you get uh, really exactly almost the same as a resin. Good. Now, the question is to understand these learn operators. What is learn? What is the nature of these learned operators? And as I said, what we tried in terms of deterministic operators through group convolution and so on didn't go anywhere. Now, we began to look at the weights and that's the work that was done by Florentin Gut uh, in particular. Okay, if you look at the SGD, uh, stochastic gradient distance, and we look in particular at CIFA, you begin, of course, with weights which are Gaussian white noise. And then you begin your initialization. One observation is that in the case of CIFAR, if you just look at the interaction across the channels after applying the wavelet coefficient, the weights, they remain Gaussian, but their covariance, which is constant because all the eigenvalues are equal to one, the spectrum is constant at initialization, is progressively going to change. And this is the evolution of the spectrum of the covariance of the weight as the epoch of the optimization grows. What is more surprising is that if you now take the weights at any given epoch and you whiten it by inverting this covariance and you compare it with the initial weights, they look very similar. If you look at the cosine angle, the cosine angle is typically between 0 0.5 and 1. That means in very high dimension that you have very correlated uh, vectors. So that means that these weight seems to rather look like Gaussian processes. So another test you can do is you whiten these weights and you look at their eigenvalue of, the, of their covariance matrices, and you look whether these eigenvalues have the same distribution of what you would have if you had a Gaussian process. And you can do that at each layer of your network. And what we observe is that the covariance is indeed very close to the marchenko pasteur distribution from the, the first layers to the last. At the last layer, you have a little bit of errors, which are these outliers, about 10% that I'll come back to. Okay. So what that suggests is to use a different type of models. It suggests that these one-one convolution will rather look like random projections with Gaussian weights. So these are the Gaussian weights and you take your input and you project it and then you apply your rectifier. This is in the case of one layer network. Now, this has been well studied uh, in machine learning. And one important observation is that you can look at the gram matrix, in other words, the kernel of the feature vector that is obtained in such a one hidden layer network. And if you look at this feature vector, inner product with the feature vector in X prime, that means that you are going to get these row of X uh, projected with the random feature with row of X prime projected with the random features. If you do, if you look at this inner product, when the width increase, this is going to converge to the expected value. And that's the work of Rahimi and Resht in the uh, years 2007, 2008, where they basically show that indeed you are going to have your kernel that is going to compute to a deterministic kernel. And in the case of a Gaussian vector, you can compute it. And this is a dot product kernel, which essentially depends upon the inner product of X with X prime transformed by the covariance of the white noise. Now, this has interesting consequence because what does it mean? It means that if you take your layer obtained after applying a random weight, the 
uh, kernel is the same than a deterministic kernel that can also be written with deterministic vector feature vectors. So from this, you can derive that your random activation layer can be viewed as a rotation of a deterministic uh, feature layer. And that's going to be really important to understand the structure of this deep net. When you have a deep network, the problem is much more difficult because you don't have one layer, but you have many layers with random weights. So to understand the properties of these random weights, what you need to understand is not just the distribution of the weight at each depth, but you also need to understand the dependencies between the weights at the different depths. Now, if you suppose that indeed at each layer, the activation coefficient is a rotation of a deterministic activation layer. In other words, all the randomness of what happened before is captured by a rotation. Then the next layer, and sorry, the if you and if you suppose that the weight at the next layer is rotated by the same rotation, which makes sense because basically what this weight sees is this input activation layer. If you rotate it, then the optimization is done with an SGD, which is covariant to rotation. It should find a solution, which is itself rotated. Then you can prove that at the next layer, the same property is going to happen. The next layer is going to have an activation layer, which is also going to rotate, to converge to a rotation of a deterministic uh, feature vector. What does that mean is that these deep nets can all can be viewed as random activation layers, but all these random activation layers are rotations of a deterministic activation layer. So to verify that, what we did is we took a trained deep net, we trained them with many different uh, uh, many different uh, initialization. And we showed that each time you can find a rotation, which is going to match it with a fixed activation layer, which doesn't depend anymore on the train. So these properties are indeed verified over the deep nets, in particular on CFR10. The consequence of that is that, yes, these deep nets have random weights, but when the width increase, they are essentially going to converge to deterministic networks. And the deterministic network, if the weights are Gaussian, can have a simple factorization. Essentially, each time you are going to have a covariance or the square root of the covariance, which is going to reduce dimensionality, and then a high dimensional embedding phi, which is captured by the white noise and the nonlinearity and then a covariance, and then a high dimensional embedding, and so on. Now, what are we learning in this problem? What we're learning are essentially the only the covariance. That's the key information that we're getting. And the class of function that we obtained here in this Hilbert space, the reproducing kernel Hilbert space, can be entirely characterized by the covariance that you have over there. So the point of these derivation is to say, essentially, when you learn these random weights, you essentially learn a covariance matrix, which is the covariance matrix of these random weights. And if you know the covariance matrix, then you can entirely specify the class of functions that are defined by, by this norm. Okay, good. So now let's try. And again, that's the work of Florent Tangut, Gaspar Rochette, and Brice Ménard. So let's come back to our neural network where all the spatial filters are calculated with wavelets and where the weights are learned. And what we're going to do is we're going to model the weights 
as Gaussian process, and the only thing that we learn are the covariance of the weight. Now, to verify that the model is appropriate, what we're going to do now is to sample a new network. In other words, once we've learned one network, we can create new networks by just computing realizations of these Gaussian processes and defining, therefore, these one-one convolution networks. If we do so, we can create many, many networks. What we've observed is that all the networks that we've been recreating have a performance which are about the same as the learned network, up to an increase of an efficiency of about 3%, but they are much, much, much better than the network where that we tried with deterministic uh, operator, which had a, a factor of four error relatively to uh, a deep. Now, this works really nicely over this database of CCAR. However, when we've been applying that for ImageNet, we observe that there is a large deviation from Gaussian. In other words, this hypothesis of having purely Gaussian weights doesn't apply anymore. And we can see it by the fact that when we whiten the, weight, the weights, when we look at their uh, distribution of eigenvalue, they don't satisfy anymore the marchenko pastor distribution. We see outlayers which are there, which cannot be explained with purely Gaussian weights. So this is still a totally open problem. So let me finish on that. Uh, what I try to show here is that the um, curse of dimensionality that we are facing because we have very high dimensional data can be reduced because we have very structured data. And in particular, this structured data have in many, many situations, including phases, including turbulence, these physical phenomena, local dependencies, once you transform them into this wavelet domain. However, this local dependency still needs to be specified. And to specify this local dependency, it is very important to eliminate the phase because otherwise all linear dependencies are zero. And that's what you do essentially with a non-linearity such as the ROLU or a modulus. Now, you can think of the learning across the channel or these one-one convolution as being a way to learn these dependencies. So what I showed is that random projection can do the job, at least in the case of CIFAR, but uh, Gaussian random projections are too restrictive as a model when you begin to deal with much more complex images such as uh, ImageNet. So let me finish by thanking my co-authors. So this work on wavelet conditional renormalization group and the physics side was done with Giulio Biroli, who is a physicist, Misaki Ozawa, and Thierry Marchand. These are physicists. The work on score-based generative modeling was done with Valatin de Bortoli and Simon Coste. The fact that you have very local dependencies across scale is a work that was done by Florentin Gute, Ero Simoncelli, and Zara Kadokai. And the final work on uh, these random projection models was again done by Florentin Gute, Rudy Rochette, and Brice Meda. So that's for the stories. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefan, for this very nice talk. So now, well, it's time for questions from the audience. So as usual, feel free to write your name in the chat and I'll give you the turn to speak. Are there any questions from the audience? Carlos, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Ah, yeah, 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 perfectly. So first of all, uh, thank you very much uh, for the talk. It was uh, very interesting. So I think uh, one key idea of the talk, maybe the most important one, is the 
like uh, when you talked about images, you said that you decompose those in like uh, details and like the course information, like, and you do that across scales and then you do the wavelength transformation for the details, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. And then at some point you said, okay, now, uh, uh, like we can let's say forget about the long range dependencies and we yeah. only have uh, local dependency and that's why you can use uh, convolutional neural networks for example with uh, uh, with small kernels right but exactly. I, I think I, I missed that reason uh, step that why uh, do the long term dependencies disappear when you decompose those in like the details and that Okay, so I can, in the case of, and you're right, I should have spent uh, more time on that. Uh, in the case, maybe I'm going to uh, show it on the, again, share screen. Uh, you can see my slide now. Yes. Okay. So if you look at what's happening here, uh, or let's say on the border, and you already have the low resolution information, that means that you already know that you had, because you have a small patch locally, that you have a transition from white to black. So you have the context. If you know that you already have a transition from white to black, then it means that you are very likely to be within an edge and therefore that you should have a high amplitude uh, wavelet coefficient. In other words, the local context of the low frequency is enough to get you the orientation of the edge and the fact that you have an edge. On the other hand, if you have here an information which tells you I am in the middle of some very regular region, it's very likely that the wavelet coefficient is going to be very small. So the low frequencies gives you a lot of context information to compute the conditional probability distribution. And I must say that in the case of the faces, I was surprised that it worked. I, I expected that to get some such reconstruct regular long contours, you would need more, but Apparently, uh, this is enough because that's exactly what we do with these networks. So this is a quite a explanation. On the other hand, I must say that it was of a bit of a surprise. The fact that it works in physics was somewhat more natural because in physics, it's known that these long range interaction can be decomposed into local interaction at different scale when you look at the physical potential. In images, it was not obvious. So that's the only, let's say, qualitative explanation I can give. So I don't know if I uh, understood it uh, correctly, but uh, what you say is like, uh, like the high frequencies, the detail are related to, let's say, uh, short, uh, short term dependency, like local dependencies. And the course information, what's not the details, gives you the information about the long. The, the long dependency that you need like to complete your information. Is that correct? Yes. And especially when you see, when you look at the, you, you look at it uh, at, in terms of wavelet coefficient, you look at this as a function of the wavelet coefficient at the same location, but different scale. You see that these wavelet coefficient, they have exactly the same location, but they also give you an information which is much more global. Especially. See, local wavelet coefficient here, they correspond to a square which is twice bigger. Local wavelet coefficient here, they correspond to a square which is four times bigger. So when you do that in this world of a wavelet coefficient, you get the context information. It's local, but it's local in a domain which is very much subsampled. Like in a different scale, right? Exactly. So it's local here, but over this image, it looks global. This is why also you, it's local in wavelet, but it's not local in this domain. I tried initially to explain it on the XJ, but I shouldn't. I should have done it directly here. 
basically local information of a wavelet still give you information which is global spatially, but it's weak. It's weak in the sense that the number of coefficients that you are using to do so is relatively small. In vision, this is also called foveal vision. You know, when in the center of your eye, you have a very high resolution and the resolution of your eye progressively is reduced as you go to the periphery. In some sense, it's as if you were building a foveal vision over each of the wavelet coefficients. So the number of coefficient of the context is small because you are still very local, but you still have information about wider and wider context because the wavelet coefficients here correspond to large domains. Is that more uh, clear? I don't know. Yeah, I, I think so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question and the answer. Any other question from the audience? I think we have time for one or more or two more questions. Any question? No? Yes. Well, in any case, I have one question at least, um, Stefan. Uh, it's quite general in any case, because as you know, theory uh, told us that if one has many more ways to adjust than examples to train with, will not be able to generalize, or at least it's extremely unlikely that we'll be able to generalize. So that is where, at a theoretical level, the Hefting inequality and the babnik chervonenkis dimension will enter together with associated error bounds. However, at an empirical level, we have, as you have mentioned, successful examples of deep neural nets with hundreds of millions of weights trained on a few thousand training examples. And I remember that Jean Lecun a few years ago in, in an interview said more or less that the theory that we had assumed to be true was wrong. So what's your opinion on that? Or how can theory and practice fit in the face of this deep learning success in the in the aspects I'm mentioning? So I think that this question now has been addressed by theory. I mean, the fact that you have much more weights than, uh, than the data is now uh, quite well understood. So there is, there was, uh, uh, I mean, at least the principle, there is this double descent uh, papers. And what I've been speaking about, the number of weights is much bigger when you do random projection. However, you have what is sometimes called the inductive bias. In other words, what's happening is that when you let the width of the network increase, then things get simpler. In a one hidden layer network, the optimization gets to be convex. In terms of mathematics, you get your kernel, which converge to something which is totally deterministic and which is relatively simple, such as a dot, uh, uh, as a dot product network. So uh, this idea that you need redundant weights to simplify the optimization and to improve uh, results, but in particular to simplify optimization, now is qualitatively understood. What is not understood is the exact structures of the weight and we are very far from it. So uh, in global terms, mathematics is very far behind the, the um, computer science right now and the algorithm. We are very far because we are still working on ImageNet, whereas people are working on uh, and don't understand ImageNet, whereas where people are working on uh, ChatGPT and uh, trillions of weights, okay? And, uh, and the same in computer vision. Uh, that's a very classic situation in science. Uh, if you look in physics, in the history of physics, between the first experimental discoveries to the theory, you typically have several centuries. Here we're speaking of 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. So it, it, I consider that as uh, not only being normal, but being great, great for math, because that means you have new problems. And I think 
what is the beauty of these problems is that the range of mathematics is very diverse. Uh, many people working in image processing before were essentially working with Fourier transform convolutions, essentially one domain of math, which is harmonic analysis, algebra, and uh, sometime a bit of differential equations. And now, boom, it's opening. You have all this world of high dimensional statistic, high dimensional probability, geometry, symmetries, and so on that comes into it. So it's very complicated also because we're in this strange situation that turbulence looks like an easy problem. But let's not forget that turbulence is, has been and is still an open problem uh, in physics. I mean, the first papers were written by Kolmogorov in 1942, and we are in 220, and we still don't have any statistical physics model of turbulence. And now this is considered as numerically simple to synthesize, but there is no theory. So the range of problems that we're facing now in terms of science are incredibly sophisticated. It's going to take time, but, I'm impressed by how much the field is moving, including now on the math side. Uh, not as fast, mathematics has always been moving slow, but it's moving. There are a lot of ideas that are coming in. And uh, I think frankly that it's a very interesting field. I'm speaking of the interface with mathematics for PhD students. Because if you don't want to have 5,000 people working in parallel in the world on a similar problem as you and with much larger GPUs, then you can go in math. There are much fewer people. And in terms of impact, it can be huge. I mean, we won't have robust system, interpretable system before we understand the math. So the problems are real. That's the little advert advertising minute for the mathematical uh, uh, interface well thank you very much for your answer and i yeah, totally agree with your perspective okay so any other question or we can end here this talk okay thank you more questions no well stefan thank you very much for your talk and answers let's keep in touch okay goodbye thank bye bye you.